Welcome to the Technologies Changing the World track of the Central Asia Nobel Fest. We hope that all of you and your families are safe and healthy. We're really happy that you're able to join us today. The main topic of our discussion is how artificial intelligence transforms the world. And we'll be having a short Q&A session at the end. Therefore, please feel free to submit your questions right now online. My name is Yedige, and I'm a Principal Research Manager at Autodesk Research, leading a team of scientists to develop the next generation of AI-enabled engineering software of the future. Previously, I worked as a postdoctoral research scientist at the University of Cambridge, leading the development of the digital transformation capabilities to transform the UK's manufacturing centre using cyber physical systems and applied AI. And it is a great honor to introduce our speakers today. Please welcome uh, Professor Kevin Warwick and Professor Michael Irwin Jordan. Professor Kevin Warwick is Emeritus Professor at Coventry and Reading Universities. His research areas are artificial intelligence, control, robotics, and biomedical engineering. He's also been called world's first cyborg. He achieved the world's first direct electronic communication between two human nervous systems, and this is the basis for human thought communication. He's the author of more than 600 research papers and has written 27 books. Kevin is currently working on brain-computer interfaces, some of them for therapy, helping people to overcome problems such as Parkinson's disease, for example. And he has shown successful results by practical experiments, and we'll be really interested to discuss what is possible in the future. Welcome, Professor Kevin Warwick. Thank you. Uh, please let me to introduce uh, Professor Michael, Michael Irwin Jordan, who is a Pihong Cheng Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, as well as Department of Statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. He's one of the most influential people in the history of machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. His research interests bridge the computational, statistical, cognitive, and biological sciences. He's been called Miles Davis of machine learning by Jan LeCun. In 2016, Professor Jordan was named the most influential computer scientist worldwide in an article in science. He's been cited near to 200,000 times and has mentored many of the world-class researchers defining the field of AI today. For example, Andrew Ng, Zubin Garamani, Ben Tasca, and Yosha Bengio. Michael is currently working on decision-making side of machine learning, which include computational, inferential, and economic perspectives. Welcome, Professor Michael Irwin Jordan. Thank you. We're very, very honored to have you here. And uh, we would like to start by giving a brief introduction to the area, because the current track is how artificial intelligence transforms the world. Uh, I just would like to bring that we would like not to discuss about the only artificial intelligence. We'd like to discuss everything related to cybernetics, which has been defined by women, as well as by machine learning because all of the machine learning terminology is coming from Joe McCarthy, but they're all the same in terms of the practicality and applicability of the artificial intelligence. So in order to define what we'll be discussing today is when we mean AI, we also mean cybernetics, machine learning, and AI all together in one field. And uh, to start to brief and to give uh, an overview to the main uh, topic of today is the practicality of uh, AI today. And uh, it seems like at the moment, most of the AI researchers think that real problems and real world problems are not that important. And many of the machine learning algorithms and methods, they uh, concise themselves in very, very small topics and they do not tackle some of the world's uh, need the challenges. And uh, here is the question that's coming from my side. How is it possible that uh, we could have the possibilities of AI applying to real world problems, but not the problems which have been defined very, very uh, limitedly by machine learning uh, community in the world? Uh, Professor Kevin Warwick, would you like to start? 
Yes, I mean, I, I take the point you're you're making about limited problems. I mean, something like a sat nav in a car, satellite navigation in a car, where we probably don't even call it artificial intelligence now, but it deals with a problem which is sort of limited, but changes the 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 machine has to adapt to any changes, modifications, and so on. Um, but it deals with it very well. 20 years ago, if you thought you were just going to follow along with what a machine tells you to do, you, you'd say, no, I, I will always do it in a different way. Whereas now you don't even think about it. You just get in the car, press the button and just follow what the machine tell, turn right, turn right. You don't even think is it a good thing or bad thing to do. And then if you turn up in the wrong place, you don't blame the machine at all. You think I must have made a mistake. Uh, so I think there are examples like that. But I, I do believe artificial intelligence is used in all sorts of areas, not just where there's a well-defined example. Maybe in the university environment for research purposes, you've got well-defined responses and answers because you've got to come to a conclusion at the end which says the machine did what we expected it to do or whatever, which almost surely you didn't need AI in the first place, perhaps. But in, say, the military domain, I think you're looking into areas where you're not sure of what the possibilities are. And certainly with autonomous vehicles, which is a really big application area for AI, then you're dealing with interaction with humans, changing environment. The, the AI needs to deal with new parameters and new possibilities. I mean, in this, this raises issues where the AI has a choice which affects humans directly. Uh, and some of those choices raise enormous ethical questions, which we need to face up to. I mean, a simple one I can give you. Um, looking at, uh, uh, this is an autonomous vehicle driving along a motorway which has several lanes, and it is the machine knows it's going to crash. The car is going to crash. There's nothing it can do about it. But it can decide, should I crash in the into the vehicle in front of me or should I change lanes and crash into this vehicle? What about stopping quickly and having the vehicle behind me crash into me? It raises all sorts of ethical issues as to who's in the cars, what is the price of the cars. You know, I, I drive a very cheap car. I, I think with this sort of basis for AI, I, my car would be quite dangerous to drive in in an AI future because everybody would be crashing into me because it's a cheap car and they wouldn't have so much insurance to pay. But it's one of those decisions where ethically, are we? how far are we going to go with AI here? We know it's possible for an AI system to make such decisions. And in a way, we could say it's a lot safer to have the AI make this decisions for us because we wouldn't, we wouldn't know half of what the AI knows. And the same really is true when it comes to financial decisions. It, I'm not too far here from the city of London where enormous um, financial transactions used to be carried out by expert humans, well-trained in the field, knew when to buy stocks, when to sell shares and so on and so forth. A lot of those people, I have to say, have been replaced by, not, not directly by machines in a way, but by machines that have people who are now expert in the software, which drives those machines, which are making much, much better trades, much better purchases at the rate, because they can deal with all sorts of dimensions of information at the same time that the human can't deal with. The machine is simply much better in a financial setup than the human experts used to be. But again, when you're looking at financial transactions, it's not just uh, money on a page, let's say if you, you're making a decision to buy coffee from Brazil instead of Kenya, for example, there's lots of people involved. You, you could have people who are being put out of work, could be even dying as a result of the artificial intelligent decision, which if we were to believe some of the, the three laws of robotics and so on, machines are not supposed to be able to do, but they can quite easily do in such environments. I think you then get into the healthcare issue where AI could be saving lives or completely changing the lives of particular people. I know this is something we'll probably get onto later in this uh, discussion, but I think AI in healthcare 
when it can make somebody's life an awful lot better, again, raising all sorts of ethical questions as to whose life do you make better and is it at the expense of somebody else and so on and so forth. Um, but I think it's everyday practical examples. I, I tried to give a number of them there where it's not a well-defined answer. It's very much a practical example and it's out there helping in different ways, but it raises all sorts of ethical issues when you give an AI choice outside those well-defined answers that you can have in a, a university environment. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, to wrap up, I think it's really important for AI to be aware of any other types of uh, parameters to make decisions. And so you mentioned a few of the applications and a few of the parameters that impact those decisions, which really need to be considered by developing the future generation of AI. Uh, coming back to the uh, question, uh, Professor Jordan, may I just point out that some of the uh, conferences that we see, which are very popular in machine learning, for example, International Conference in Machine Learning, only had 1% of papers which are dealing with real world problems. And so we've seen earlier that the machine learning helped to define the first image of the black hole. Machine learning helped to define the structure of the DNA. Uh, what steps can we do to make that uh, even more and more emerging to make sure that we bring machine learning to real world problems? Well, I have a different perspective. I think that machine learning has been used for 40 or 50 years on lots of real world problems. Uh, you just don't talk about it as much. So you need to distinguish uh, AI or machine learning as an aspiration versus uh, as a practical engineering tool and discipline. As an aspiration, it goes back, as you know, to McCarthy or whatever in the 50s. You know, what, it's almost a philosophical question. Can we put intelligence in the computer and have it be as intelligent as a human? And that's a fascinating science fiction kind of question. Uh, in my career of you know, watching this for 30 or 40 years, we're not getting at all close to that. We don't have human style intelligence in the computer. and I don't think we will have that in our lifetime. So that's not what we should mean by AI. Rather, what's happened is, is that large scale data analysis capabilities have been developed, pattern recognition, and they've been deployed in large scale problems. And they're providing a kind of intelligence um, that we didn't have 100 years ago. And so already in the 1990s, uh, you had companies like Amazon uh, doing fraud detection or the banks with very large scale data looking about, you know, here, here's a credit card being used somewhere. Is that a fraud or not? Right. And um, that was essential for e-commerce to start. If you couldn't do fraud detection on huge amounts of data, uh, then you would not have been able to do e-commerce. Okay. And that was done with machine learning. It was called uh, techniques called random forests. And it was done on large sets of computers, not one on one computer. It was the beginnings of the cloud. And it was very much real world uh, machine learning. The algorithm was developed by Leo Breiman working on some smaller problems, but it was clear how to use, how to scale from that smaller problem to the bigger problem. Okay. Also in that era, uh, supply chain modeling was done by Amazon. If you're going to serve billion products to hundreds of millions of people, you have to know how it's all coming together. What are the pieces? How, what will, will that clock be ready in time because, you know, a hundred million people want it in China um, and so on. So this in historically hundreds of years ago it was done by people writing down things on ledgers and calculating how long it would take for ships to come across the ocean and all. You can't do that with billions of products and where things are changing every day. So the intelligence of the computing system, and it's not just one computer, it's the whole system, was needed to be able to build a viable system. And that's another billion dollar economy that was based on machine learning, right? Recommendation systems brought kind of people and new services into play and allowed people to start to interact with computers in a more intelligent way. That was a system. So there was, entire, there was if you will, artificial intelligence in the human uh, computer system that was doing commerce at scale already by the year 2000. All right. So I would resist the notion that machine learning has only looked at small, not real world problems. I think it's actually been at the, the beginnings of the, uh, the IT revolution that's gone beyond search and, uh, you know, and databases. It's, it's allowed us to have data start to play a role in our, in our, in our uh, commerce, in our transportation systems, in our medical systems. 
All right, so the right way to think about AI to me is not a single computer or a robot that has got intelligence and we have to worry about its decisions. It's to think about the big system that's being built when you bring data together in a computer with human activities in the real world. And that is ongoing, it's in every industry, um, it's, uh, it's changing the world, um, and there are all kinds of uh, dilemmas, ethical and other, um, about resource allocations, about how to partner with people in social science, partner with people in the law, partner with politicians to think about the meaning of all of this, right? But it has nothing really to do with AI and artificial superintelligence or anything like that. It has to do with building large scale systems that do things in the real world. Already an economic system that brings food into a city is making lots of little decisions that aren't being made by any single human being, right? but the system is making large numbers of decisions and it's making resource allocation decisions, all right? It's deciding that more food goes here than here. That has implications for people's lives. You know, are they gonna be able to eat? Are they gonna be able to have what they need? Those are ethical things to worry about. And one already worries about that for decades or centuries really in economics. So there's really not very much that's new here. This is not a revolutionary period. Right. These are issues that are getting at scale to be, you know, more and more concerning and more and more worth thinking about and planning for. But really, AI is just data analysis at scale right now. Maybe in the future, it'll be something different that already has immense implications. And that's what we should be focused on. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Jordan. I completely agree that uh, with your point that uh, we have seen some of the best applications of AI already in the last uh, three, four decades. And uh, some of us may not have the appreciated the uh, success and the results that uh, machine learning was bringing to all of us in supply chains, economics, uh, any types of uh, IT industry advancement and so on and so forth. And uh, beginning with some of the challenges that you mentioned, do you think that uh, it is possible to set up the challenges and to identify uh, at this stage when these challenges can be solved using the machine learning. So will you allow me to give uh, two challenges to Professor Kevin Warwick and two challenges to Professor Michael Jordan and uh, to give your, uh, to ask for your opinion when we will be able to reach them. So the first two challenges, uh, Professor Kevin Warwick, when do you think the uh, machine learning or AI system will outperform hand-built medical diagnosis system? And the second challenge is ah. when machine learning uh, and AI-based system will make and uh, outperform the uh, new scientific laws, uh, will create the new scientific laws in physics and chemistry better than the human. Well, it, it's going to be a different answer. Rather than saying it's two years' time or 10 years' time, it's all a little bit different. I, I agreed with a lot of what Michael said, particularly with AI or whatever we're going to call it, being somewhat different to, to human intelligence. And one of the differences, advantages of AI, if you like, is the ability to deal with lots and lots of dimensions at the same time. The human brain is okay with three dimensions and we think of space around us as being three dimensional, when of course it's not, it's, it's space around us and we put our construct onto it. So for AI, understanding whatever the problem is in many, many dimensions is a different way of working with it. But we get lots of examples from that. For, for example, in a supermarket, if I go to the supermarket, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to buy, but I get there and I'll take this, I'll take that. Now, we did a whole study based on 50,000 people using credit cards in a supermarket. This was for one of the big supermarket chains in the UK and found that people tend to, this is you based AI on, it was about a hundred dimensions looking at different products. Humans are a lot more predictable than we imagine we're going to be. So much so that apart from odd things that you rarely buy, like shoe polish, which you, you just suddenly decide on once every three years or whatever, the standard food stuff, such as milk and cheese and all of the bread, the AI system, the very simple system, was able to predict pretty accurately what people were going to buy before they went into the supermarket. So much so that I was thinking, well, the, the challenge would be, why do I even need to think about what I 
going to buy when I get to the supermarket? Why not have an AI system which will do the shopping for me? And it didn't buy, by and large, as long as it gets it 90% right, I might have to put the odd product back. Um, it, it's just a challenge. Could we have an AI system to replace a human as far as supermarkets are concerned? And practical reality. When it comes to healthcare, though, rather than being it, the, we use an AI system instead of human care, it's, it's as a complement. One, one of the research projects I'm involved with with surgeons at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford is looking at deep brain stimulation for Parkinson disease. So this is when the patient has electrodes in their brain to apply pulses to counteract the problem. But we use it for monitoring what's going on in the brain. And this is fed into the electrical activity in the brain, is fed into an AI system, which predicts pretty accurately ahead of time when the patient is going to have the tremors or the muscle locking that is associated with the, the Parkinson's disease in this case. Now, the patient themselves doesn't know that they're going to have the tremors until they actually occur. But the AI system can wave a flag and say, well, in 20 seconds time, you're going to have tremors starting up because it's in a different part of the brain and so on. Also, the AI system is able to say, well, because of the electrical activity, it is this type of Parkinson disease. So the surgeon knows, well, if it's this type of Parkinson disease, we can treat it in a different way. So the system, again, is, is giving information on what's going on in the human brain that otherwise we would not know. We can't look at it and say, yes, that's this, this, this. It's only using multidimensional information that the AI system is processing and adapting and learning to each patient, to, to deal with each patient. So it, for me, two challenges are when the second challenge, the supermarket being the first one, the second challenge would be when could we have the complementary treatment? So somebody who is... Uh, has deep brain stimulation are able to have an AI system working in real time on their brain. Effectively, part of their brain with treatment is an AI system making real time decisions based on what's going on in their brain, the electrical activity to counteract bad um, electrical signals that you don't want there. That's a real world problem part of your brain effectively becomes an AI system. Thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you for bringing the predictions as well as some of the uh, works that you mentioned. Uh, we would like to ask more on the second topic. I uh, will bring that up in the future. And uh, uh, Michael, do you think that uh, machine learning will be able to outperform the hand-built natural language processing system of translation in the near future? And do you think the machine learning system will be able to make a legal decision that is relies just on the basis of machine learning decisions? That's actually a very easy uh, question to answer. The answer in both cases is clearly no. <laughs> you know, what machines are really pretty good at right now is very low level data analysis, finding patterns uh, fi and putting labels on data. You know, in this image, there's a, you know, a rabbit or, or a person or, or, uh, or to move my hand to, you know, from here to here to grasp something. Here's what I need to do, right? Uh, what we're very, very far away from is high-level reasoning, even about images, about if I were to drop something, what exactly is going to happen? Um, if, uh, you know, someone comes out from behind that door, where will they walk? Where do I need to move to? All that kind of visual reasoning. But then the symbolic kind of reasoning that we do about like social relationships, um, about uh, the planning of how I go through a day, um, you know, all the subtleties having to do with how humans interact with the world and with each other. Uh, we don't have anything like that in computers. All right. And so natural language is all about building models of the world and building models of relationships, including social relationships, including physical relationships including all kinds of conceptual ideas in various sorts of spheres and using metaphors and analogies between them. Um, language is amazingly flexible 
uh, you know, every sentence I'm saying right now has probably never been said exactly in that same way. And I'm actually not even saying multiple sentences. It's all one long sentence, but that's not a problem for you. You're understanding everything, right? Uh, it's, it's just really, really hard to put that kind of thing into a computer and have anything reasonable happen. Okay. So what's being done right now is very low level pattern recognition with machines. They're finding sentences that are like sentences that have been seen before and they're doing things with that, okay? That's not understanding. So what's missing right now is completely the whole notion of understanding the sentence. Now, it's not impossible to start to have machines understand things. It, it's definitely part of our science to understand how that can happen. It's just gonna be a very long, slow period. It'll take you know decades to start to get there, I think, and maybe a hundred years before we start to get some fluency with, with natural language, with really expressing yourself, understanding what's being said. When you and I are talking about something, maybe let's talk about a sports match that you saw yesterday. You saw a tennis match and this is happy. You start telling me about it. I'm gonna not just hear the sentence you've said and said, oh, those are like sentences I've heard in the past. And therefore the next sentence he's gonna say is this. Rather, I'm going to build a mental model of the tennis match that you're describing. And I'm going to think about what's going on in that. And when you say something, I'm going to integrate that into my mental model. Computers are doing nothing of that right now. So they can't even be thought of as understanding natural language at all. Okay. So if you ask them to reason about a court opinion, which has to do with all kinds of consequences of human behavior and how it relates to the legal system and all that, but we're not even within 100 years of that. Okay. So it's not even worth talking about, I think. Now, can computers do some minimal natural language, like, for example, help us with something broken in our house that I just bought a new uh, refrigerator and it's broken? I can call up um, and the computer can answer. And I could say, I, I bought a refrigerator. Well, you can pattern match and, and understand, oh, you bought a refrigerator. And the next thing they might ask is it's not uh, cooling. And the computer might know to, add, to say something like, well, did you plug it in? And things like that is, is minimal understanding. I would even hardly call it understanding, but it's enough that you could actually have people do that. Um, and people could maybe make reservations at, you know, at restaurants and things like that. Um, so these are little kind of tricks or toys, but you can build businesses around them, right? It doesn't have to be super intelligent to build a business. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing, um, right? But, but it's, it's just not human understanding of language at all. Um, and it's going to take a very, very long, it's going to be a very interesting trajectory. I hope I'll live long enough to start to see it happen, but it's going to be, you know, decades before we start to develop the kind of understanding that you and I have about almost anything in the real natural world. Thank you very much, Michael. And I'm really glad that you brought up the challenges of the natural language processing systems. Uh, as I recall, there was a research study which identified the analysis of the uh, sports papers and sports newspapers and there were many articles which were describing tennis, football and other types of uh, different types of sports but nowhere in that newspaper was the word sport. So AI was not able to understand that this is the sports newspaper because there was no word sport. So uh, as you mentioned these are one of the main challenges that reasoning and understanding of AI machine learning systems are far behind the uh, developed stage that you mentioned. And I would really uh, like to draw in some of the thoughts that we had from Kevin and some of the thoughts that you had from Michael. Uh, some of the capabilities that we can have, some of the uh, low level capabilities can be trusted to AI at this stage. But if we're talking about really high-end developments in uh, translating language real-time, making core decisions or making the operational decisions for the surgeons, that's too high-end. But we are able to make sure that AI will be able to help us, at least at this stage, to compensate us, to help in the multiple and large-scale decision-making. And uh, this is where the first steps will start. So this brings us to the second topic of our discussion. Uh, as uh, Kevin, you mentioned about the predictions that uh, machine learning system was uh, doing. Uh, so recently there was a paper published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and its title is Measuring the Predictability of Life Outcomes with Scientific Mass Collaboration. And uh, in that paper, they mentioned that it was one of the most uh, uh, 
titles and one of the most detailed and labeled data set that machine learning uh, scientists could have. So it was 15 years of data of many people and uh, 160 research teams from different universities, they were analyzing this data and they were trying to predict some of the life outcomes of the families based on that data. So what happened is that there was 160 submissions and uh, these submissions included the best algorithms for machine learning with one of the best data sets and uh, they predicted what actually happened. And the results were really disappointing. So even the best performing prediction models were slightly better than the random samples. And uh, I think, Michael, you also mentioned in some of your early interviews that the, the perfect prediction is really difficult and almost impossible. So uh, my question is uh, addressing to you, Michael, you mentioned that uh, because machines do not have the true intelligence, can this challenge of uh, making the machine learning prediction be addressed by, let's say, data-free hypothetical reasoning, like about causes, and which will be backed up by empirical checks, but without big data as we're talking about? Uh, what type of uh, things and steps do you think we can do to make this prediction better? Uh, will something like Stackelberg equilibria in game theory will help, or will be... Uh, Something like in your recent paper, you mentioned that sampling can be faster than optimization. Do you think that type of approach will help? I'm really uh, wondering what is your opinion on this? Yeah, no, I don't think prediction is the, uh, is the main goal of AI, okay? It's part of it. it. It's one half at best, right? And you're never going to solve the big AI problem by only doing prediction, even making it better and, and making causal inference and all that, all right? Um, really, when we start making large scale, meaningful decisions in the world, we're thinking at the moment, all right? We're not necessarily only using past data to inform what we, what we do, okay? I like to use examples of like building a system that'll help transportation in a city really work well, okay? Um, so I would like to go from here to the airport really fast, all right? So I type that in or, you know, or, I, or, I, my, or my brain waves tell the machine, you know, that I wanna go to the airport, right? Um, now, there's probably a fastest route to the airport, and you could probably, based on data analysis from the past, figure out what that is, all right? Um, now, if I'm the only person in the world, you could tell me to go on that path and it will be great, right? But I'm not the only person in the world. There's many people in the world. And if you tell everybody to go on the same path, uh, you're going to create congestion, and it's no longer the best path, okay? So you could say, well, oh, I made a bad prediction, right? Well, no. What the problem is is that there was scarcity, Right, and uh, the situation is now a brand new situation that no one's ever quite been in before. And so what would you like in that situation? Would you like for the computer to start to say, well, I need to find more causes of that person's behavior. I need to figure out from their past history how much of a hurry they are all, always in. If that's a person that's always in a hurry, then I wanna send them down the best path. If it's a person who's not in a hurry, I can send them down the slow path. Well, that's not fair, that's not reasonable right? You want to not think you know everything about people and predict everything about them. You want to, in the moment, let them have some role in the decision making. So in particular, the person who's often going slow might need to go to the hospital that day, right? You're not going to know that from the past, from the data. There's no pretty way you're going to make that prediction, right? So what you want to realize is that you're not creating a predicting system here. You're creating an economy. You're creating a situation in which people have they want to make bids. They want to, to value things. They want to see the options. They want to compete, perhaps. They want to have a utility. So I might um, say, um, the, the computer might know for me that I'm not really such in a hurry today because I could stop and have an ice cream and that would be great because my child's in the back and, you know, uh, the computer will not know that. But if the system allows me to sort of, you know, not make a high bid on going down that path, you know, and save my money for another day, then I'll be pretty happy. And then someone else who needs to go to the hospital can put in a high bid and they'll get that road and they'll go. Now, I don't want to be sitting and doing auctions and bids all the time in my life, but that's where the computer can also help me. It can be the auctioneer on my behalf, right? It can make that. But we are creating a system which allows us to make decisions, not based on predictions, but based on in the moment thinking about the alternatives. And yeah, some game theory can help with that a bit. Um, 
But just also, also think about the medical one, which uh, Kevin was alluding to earlier. I think it's really important to realize when you go into a doctor and a machine makes a prediction about whether you're going to have a heart attack or not, that's only the first beginning of a dialogue with the doctor. You're going to now say, well, what if I were to eat better? Or what if I, or, or you might remember something about your past that suddenly becomes relevant because of the new context. And you'll say that, you know, hey, did you know that my father had a this or that? And you didn't have that as part of the data, so, but now it became relevant. And so there's a whole dialogue and there's counterfactuals and all of that. So decision-making is not just prediction. It'll never be just prediction. Perfect prediction is not meaningful or possible. Um, so it's building systems that allow you to respect that, that people, when they're making decisions, have to worry about uh, relevance issues, about scarcity issues, about all the interactions. And that's what we do all the time. I think about what's going to happen next, what you might do, and, what, and so on. So you're right about Stack Overview. That's part of it. But that's just one particular idea from uh, you know, economic theory. Uh, many more people are going to need to think about this systems building prop perspective, engineering perspective, putting together multiple pieces and decision making. Um, so it is really the AI buzzword. The problem has been that it's been focused on a single kind of robot making a decision. And that's such a wrong perspective for the problems we're facing. Thank you, Michael. And um, thank you for bringing up uh, the possibilities uh, that you mentioned that predictions are never going to be very accurate if we rely on just the past data. As I understand, uh, you think, and uh, this might be really true, that the world is highly stochastic and we will never be able to predict what happened next just because we know what have been done in the past. We need to have some decision-making uh, real-time right here and right now. And this brings me to a uh, question, uh, Kevin. Some of your recent works on uh, treating Parkinson's disease involve embedding sensing and as well as closed-loop feedbacks. Do you think that predictions can be enhanced using real-world data and uh, awareness of what's happening real-time and right now? Oh, of course, very much so. Um, and I, I've experimented with different implants, as you've been saying, and I, I feel that, again, for healthcare, one of the ways we could easily go, not just for intensive care for therapy, but for everybody, really, is having embedded sensors that are giving all sorts of information in terms of temperature, pressure, fluid flow, those sort of things, in real time inside the body. Medical personnel prefer to have technology implanted rather than electrodes being stuck all over the place that can cause more problems than you're overcoming. So I think the future we're going to see will involve a form, I think as Michael's in referring to, data processing, if you like, in some type of AI system to monitor what's going on I can see it happening with intensive care patients, implanted sensors, maybe in several places over the body with an AI system being relied on to wave a flag where there is some problem or something occurring. And, and again, I would agree with Michael that then, then it probably needs a surgeon or a human to come along and say, yes, we'll give, do this for the person or what it actually means. But one thing to, uh, to pick up on Michael saying about natural language processing, where I have been involved with this is with the Turing test. And I've been involved in all sorts of, often with chatbots, as it were, all sorts of Turing tests. Now, I think the Turing test um, is probably one of the best known examples in the computer science field, but perhaps one of the least understood examples in the computer science, understood by humans, that is, in the computer science field. Because what it's all about, as Turing, this is as Turing stated it, not as anybody else stated it, what it's all about is for a machine to try and pretend to be a human in conversation. And one of the things you experience when you're looking at Turing tests, get practical, this is real world, humans conversing either with another human or with a machine. One of the things that you, you come across, first of all, is that you, particularly in universities, they'll say, well, why don't we have this with all sorts of complex language possibilities that nobody ever talks like that. When, when you're 
using Turing tests, you've got a whole range of people, some university people, but people in everyday life and nothing to do with universities and so on that talk in a different way, maybe with a, a, a slang in, in many ways. The machine is very good at everyday conversation and so on, so much so that if you are the interrogator, it's very difficult to decide, not just because the machine is doing okay at everyday conversation, but because the human, that maybe if you're conversing with a human, they're not that wonderful. When it, we, we are not as good as we think we are when it comes to conversation, um, particularly everyday conversation. So when we're looking at natural language processing, what I'd really like is if we put the, what's, what's, required is for the machine to talk in everyday life, not for the machine to talk in some highfalutin expert way that nobody actually talks like. It's very maybe a small group of people. We're not looking for the machine to try and copy what a, a professor of computer science or whatever that, that, that they talk like. We're looking at a machine to copy every day what someone in a shop might sound like which is a very different type of thing that we're heading for. And it's, a, it's not such a high parameter. So it's looking at what is required when we're assessing a machine for natural language processing. Thank you very much, Kevin. I think uh, you brought up very, very interesting topic here. And this uh, naturally flows into the topic uh, number three that we would like to discuss today, because uh, some of the, um, the community members in machine learning, uh, they are thinking that true artificial intelligence is not mimicking human decisions. And a true intelligence is different from human intelligence because humans have biases, humans have limitations, and it is not uh, one of the best uh, solutions to mimic all of the humans' decisions and uh, make sure that this is all covered under artificial intelligence. No doubt mimicking humans is really, really difficult. And as you mentioned, uh, machine cannot make a cup of tea uh, and we should not downgrade the machine, but it can do many sorts of other things and they're smart in their own way. And this brings me to the discussions of that, uh, as Michael, you mentioned earlier that True intelligence have not yet been defined because at the moment we are reusing human intelligence and we are reusing and somebody was even saying recycling some of our decisions and calling it as true intelligence. And uh, without going into too philosophical question of what true intelligence is, uh, I would like to ask your opinion of what will be uh, the best steps towards exploring that true intelligence? Is it a fusion of science, economy, as Michael mentioned, and Kevin, as you mentioned, some of the medicine knowledge that we have from the past and fusing that all together? And perhaps some psychology will help to go towards that North Star direction of defining the true intelligence. And uh, also, once this true intelligence has been defined, what can be done uh, to evaluate that intelligence? We all understand that Turing test was really excellent example, and, uh, but what can be uh, designed as the next generation test that can evaluate that true intelligence? Kevin? Oh, I, I mean, it's the, the, the big question, which is probably the most unanswerable question this, in terms of any intelligence form. Um, I, I think even an IQ test, all that is, is a set of questions set up by a specific person, uh, and often it's very much related to specific topics. And if you do well on an IQ test, what are you showing? Are you showing you're intelligent? Well, that's an interesting, uh, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. But what you are showing is that you can answer these specific questions from this specific person at that specific time, um, and if you answer them next week, you can do it a lot better because you've got some experience, although some uh, psychologists say that's not possible. You can't improve your IQ. I mean, how that is not possible, I don't know. So I, I don't know the answer. I honestly don't know. I think as we're going back originally to the start of the discussion, 
AI or machine learning or intelligence in a machine form is quite something different to human intelligence. We can try and shoehorn it and get it to copy human intelligence, such as in, in natural language processing or whatever. Um, it's probably never going to be able to copy exactly how a human is because we'll keep moving the goalposts. But it's more looking at it as complementary intelligence. And so my own interest is not so much defining what intelligence is per se, but in saying, well, how can we achieve a combined form of intelligence that surpasses what we've got as human intelligence now? Thank you very much, Kevin. Michael, um, I would like to know your opinion on this as well. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. Uh... I think that learning is a much more useful thing to try to define. Learning means adaptive, it means robust, it means responsive. Um, and these are all things you can start to make into mathematics and have objective functions and start to argue whether it's doing it or not. You can start to argue whether or not there's external consequences that you haven't taken into account and build a bigger system. Um, and I think that that's a better way to go. Is a system able to learn? Um, that to me is interesting. Um, I agree with the Turing test. In fact, I'd say what Kevin is really sort of saying, it's time to retire it. It, 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 it incentivizes research on faking human behavior. Yeah. Okay. And we shouldn't be incentivizing the faking of human behavior. That's just not a good research goal for us. All right. The other way to think about this is I think our era is really the emergence of a new branch of engineering. And it's an engineering that is kind of cybernetics. It has humans and data and decisions and uh, uh, you know, it, it all together in, in a big system. And so if you think about previous branches of engineering, you know, chemistry you know, led to chemical engineering, electricity led to electrical engineering. I don't think the electrical or say the chemical engineers set out by saying, what's the what's the, uh, the goal is to make the best world, you know, super product, right? To make a, uh, a factory that'll turn out a super product that'll just change everything, right? And what are the consequences of that? I don't think they were necessarily trying to be science fiction people. They were just trying to say, how can I, you know, make chlorine to make the pools more, you know, disinfected so that I save lives? You know, how do I make this and that? So I can, you know, and do it at scale and do it in a safe way and do it in an economically viable way and, and just kind of build that up as a discipline, right? And I think that's the right way to think about this one is, is that instead of going for the super intelligence and the definition of intelligence and the Turing test and all that, you know, that was an interesting history. I really realized that we're seeing the emergence of a branch of engineering and think about the ingredients to make that better and better. Just like people that did, you know, uh, flight control. You know, you can get on an airplane now and feel pretty safe because a lot of smart people thought about how to keep the airplanes all in the air, you know, flying around, not hitting each other. And that took, a, you know, decades, really. Uh, and that's in each domain that AI is being applied to. That's what we kind of have to think about is how to do that, how to make it really good, safe, interesting, you know, allow it to interact well with humans. And, and, and eventually some principles will emerge, like, just like in chemical engineering, you know, new kinds of principles emerge. It's a mathematical field. And that'll happen here, too. But trying to make that definition kind of the goal and then going after that, I, I just think is, is really a, uh, you know, a, a mistake. Um, the one theme that you've raised, though, I want to return to a little bit that we haven't maybe done quite justice to is how do you develop benchmarks and how do you develop test sets and how do you kind of help the field to move along by having concrete things to do, right? And for pattern recognition and vision systems, that was kind of possible. You could get people to label images and that was really important. You'd have this really clear yes, no data kind of thing. And for things like logistics chains and you know, supply chains and medical diagnosis and all the kind of things involving loops out in the real world and all, it's hard to develop a test bed. You know, it's hard to even get data. Some of the companies might be doing these things, but they don't give out the data. And, and so a really important goal for research in this field that might include government and fundraisers and, uh, and you know, partnerships with industry is to create realistic test beds for things like large-scale decision-making systems. You know, um, this has been done in other disciplines in physics and biology and so on. And we really need that here so that we could try out our, our, our thinking before it goes off into a company and maybe works and maybe doesn't work. Um, so, uh, you know, hard questions to think about. And, it, you know, for me, it has more to do with the learning systems. So, you know, think about how to evaluate a good learning system in a large-scale uh, domain. All right. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Michael. And um, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, this has been really, really exciting discussions. And I'm uh, sorry that we are on top of our time to end uh, this discussion. I just would like to wrap up that we need to uh, look into the bright future of using the AI and machine learning techniques on lower level capabilities of helping humans, as well as there are some certain capabilities of the future that AI and machine learning can bring towards the future. And uh, Professor Mike Lerben Jordan, Professor Kevin Warwick, it has been wonderful to have you and it's been an honor. And thank you very much for your valuable discussions. To thank all of our viewers, thank you very much for joining us today. We are looking forward to see you on the next session of the Central Asia Nobel Fest. Stay well, stay safe, and uh, have a good time at the Central Asia Nobel Fest. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.